Hello everybody, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, rescue TE examination and uh, again uh, this is going to be a fairly short presentation. What I do recommend you do is go to PT Masters. So There's actually I think three to four uh, part presentation on rescue examination which I think complements this uh, very well. Uh, most of the references for this actually are are from uh, up to date on uh, examination value or PT uh, examination value. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I have no uh, disclosures. So we'll, we'll do this uh, uh, case based. So you, you're called urgently to the operating room by your colleague. A 56 year old man is undergoing an emergency laparotomy for a liberal laceration following a motor vehicle collision. Uh, the patient's blood pressure has acutely dropped to 65 on 45, heart rate's 125, and the SpO2 is now 85%. So you wander all over and uh, you walk into the room and everybody's in, in quite a panic and you insert uh, the TE Pro uh, with no difficulties. You have one minute to determine what's going on. What are the three most valuable views during the rescue TE exam? So here's the answer. So again, this is from the original guidelines uh, showing the 20 images, but now it's been expanded uh, further in the most recent guidelines. But probably the three most valuable views, uh, if you're in a hurry, would be view number A, which was the mid-esophageal fortune review. Uh, the other views would be the view uh, number, I'm trying to find it here, uh, view number I, which is the mid-esophageal AV long axis view. And lastly, the view number D, which would be the transgastric mid short axis view. So if you had to put bang on your buck of what views you needed to do immediately, those are the three that you should do. The only other exception would be if there was a high clinical suspicion of a dissection, then, uh, then aortic views might be more warranted. When you're doing a rescue T, you're really trying to find out what's going on very, very quickly and make a diagnosis to hopefully alter therapy. So, Doing a systematic approach at this point, at the beginning, during a crisis is of little value. Once a problem is determined, then you can go back and look at the other views and do a complete uh, 2D and uh, Doppler examination of the heart. With those three views, meaning the metasophageal four chamber, the metasophageal AV long axis view, and the transgastric mid short axis view, you can see many things. You can see fluid around the heart or compression of the right atrium or the ventricles. You can see if there's mitral regurgitation, which be indicative of ischemia or rupture. You can also see contractility in ischemia. Uh, and again, it allows you to see most of the major, and actually to re rephrase, it allows you to see all the territories of uh, the coronary territories. And lastly, and probably more importantly, you can look at the chamber size, particularly the internal chamber, uh, chamber size, looking for evidence of hypovolemia. So in that previous case, uh, you're called urgently. What is the differential diagnosis for that, uh, for what's going on? Hypotension, tachycardia, and low SATs. Well, this is a basic anesthesia answer, but it can be a number of things. Uh, it could be hypovolemic shock, distributive shock, cardiogenic shock, or obstructive shock. And we're going to go through these uh, uh, step by step. We're not going to go through neurogenic shock at this point. So let's start with the first. What are the TEE findings of hypovolemic shock? So here's a picture of hypo. On the left side, you see normal volemia, and you see the end diastolic volume uh, persists. There's no kissing of the populars. On the right-hand side, with hypovolemic shock, 
you see kissing of the peplers. And also your in die star volume is, uh, is less. So some of the signs or TE signs would be an in-systolic LV obliteration or kissing walls. You could get a rightward deviation of the intralateral septum. You could have a small IBC or do a sniff test. And you could get regional wall motion abnormalities. This is for your entrance to here. You could also look at uh, uh, Dr. Vegas's uh, excellent echo textbook. But these are the normal ranges of uh, uh, ranges for LV dimensions, volumes, and also uh, ejection fraction. Now let's go to distributive shock. What are the TE findings of distributive shock? So to do distributive shock is most likely sepsis. So let's, uh, that's the best way to think of distributive shock. And let's look at this. So again, here's a picture here. I'm sorry about that. My slide is not uh, uh, looking very well. But as you can see here, it's very hyperdynamic, extremely hyperdynamic. And you get a very uh, small LV cavity at end systole with normal in diastolic volumes. Again, very small LV cavity at end systole and very and normal in diastolic volume stored diastole. Very important equation if you don't calculate, and you can calculate this through uh, through echo is your SVR. Uh, by taking your map minus your CVP, which you obtain from your central line, you can uh, get your cardiac output through uh, echo through doing the continuity equation. And if you multiply that by uh, factor 80, that will give you your SVR. Normal SVR is between 1200 and 1600, respectively. So what are the TE findings for cardiogenic shock? So this is a little bit of a trick question, but it actually depends on what is going on. If it's LV failure, if it's RV failure, if it's myocardial ischemia, or it's aortic dissection or injury. So this is your picture of LV failure. And as you can see here, you have an extremely dilated left ventricle. And it's uh, basically the extrusion is very limited and there's basically no thickening. The EF I would describe here is probably less than 10%. So this guy or lady is an extreme, uh, is an extremist. Again, there's a lot of fancy ways to quantify LV failure. Uh, but again, this is rescue T. Are you really gonna spend time and do a 3D uh, jelly bean? Or are you gonna do M mode and quantify it, or are you going to uh, look at uh, changes in your end diastolic volume and your end systolic volumes, such as your fractional area change? No, you need to do this quickly. You need to use the eyeball test. Who cares if it's 25% or 20%? You need to determine whether it's a good heart or a bad heart. If you want to quantify it later, to follow changes in with your management, and then go ahead. But in a rescue TEE, uh, you just need to make gross determinations of function and determine whether that is the issue. These are some of the uh, some of the measurements uh, that you can do in regards to evaluating LV failure. But again, eyeball, eyeball, eyeball. And if you got really fancy, you can do strain again. Uh, but again, eyeball. This next uh, picture, RV failure. And as you can see here, the RV is not contracting very well. 
There are many ways to determine RD failure, but you can probably guess what I'm going to say. In a rescue TD, use your eyes. Do not do anything fancy. Is the RV working? Is the RV not working? And then you can, uh, again, proceed to do something more complex. Measures of RV failure are the following. Uh, probably the most common one would be TAPSI. So uh, TAPSI, uh, which is excursion of mitral valve, uh, less than 60 millimeters is uh, indicative of RV dysfunction. Again, you can do some other fancy modalities, but again, this is rescue TEE, and the answer always is eyeball test. Does the patient pass the eyeball test? Is the LV or the heart working? Yes or no. Is there a volume outside the heart? Yes or no. Is there appropriate volume inside the heart? Yes or no. Eyeballs, eyeballs, eyeballs. Another cause of heart failure or dysfunction would be myocardial ischemia. Uh, there are 17 segments of the heart. And, uh, and basically for each segment, you want to look at endocardial uh, motion and thickening. These numbers you will have to be familiar with for the examination. That's TJ. And the problem with a patient with aortic dissection, you can get uh, dysfunction for numerous reasons. Reasons one would be the dissection flap uh, protruding through the aortic valve, causing aortic regurgitation. Two, you can have problems with uh, the flap. Uh, dissected into the corners, uh, particularly the right and left. And two, three, you can have, uh, uh, if it extends, you can get uh, tapping out and collection of fluid uh, around the heart. One thing that uh, it's very important to determine is whether, what is the true lumen of false lumen? I can't uh, stress how important that is. Uh, it's not important in making the diagnosis of uh, dissection, but it's important when you are now doing surgical intervention. Uh, many times you need to insert uh, cannulas in the groin or a cannula in the axillary, and you need to ensure that it's going uh, into the true lumen and not the false lumen. These are some of the signs of, to help you determine that, uh, the, the difference between the true lumen and false lumen. Uh, what I typically look for is usually it's the, the false lumen uh, is larger than the true lumen and you actually look for uh, color flow and you can sometimes follow the curvature of the flap and lastly the pulsatility. And I discussed with this to you already but aortic sections are complicated by infusions LV dysfunction because of uh, coronary disruption, and also uh, you can get air insufficient about 60% of the time if it's an atraumatic dissection. Traumatic dissections uh, such as MVCs typically occur closer to the uh, takeoff of the, of the subclavian or the isthmus. The last uh, type of shock would be obstructive shock. And what are the TE findings of obstructive shock? Again, similar to my previous question about what are the TE findings of cardiogenic shock? It depends. It depends whether it's a cardiac tamponade, whether it's a pulmonary embolus, or a pneumor or hemothorax. This is an example of tamponade. Uh, as you can see here, there's a large collection uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is outside the right side of the heart, particularly the right atrium, and you see some flapping of the uh, free wall of the right atrium. Again, in the, uh, in the emergency echo or rescue echo, use your eyes. You don't need to do anything more fancy. Tapenad is a diagnosis, uh, is a clinical diagnosis, but echo helps reconfirm or confirm that clinical diagnosis. If you have an unstable patient and you have a significant fluid around the heart, it's tapenad until proven otherwise. 
Uh, some signs of cardiac tamponade are the following. Uh, they include collapse of the intracardiac chambers, created a one-third systole of the right atrium. You can also have RV diastolic collapse. You get IVC dilatation without respiratory variation. There's intraventricular independence. And you can also do some, uh, look at some diastolic uh, diastology through the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, looking for changes, uh, uh, variations. Uh, again, extremely hard to diagnosis unless it's very proximal. This is a very proximal uh, pulmonary embolus in the, uh, in the uh, right PA. So you can see proximal disease occasionally, but typically you have to look for more indirect causes or signs of PE. And that includes uh, RV dysfunction, the McConnell sign, which is a hypokinetic RV free wall, sparing the apex, uh, uh, TR, moderate to severe. And as in the AS, I, I wrote goes, but bows to the left side in about 98% of the time. And last would be uh, hemo or uh, pneumothorax. And uh, again, this is an example. Uh, you, for the, uh, for the left side, just look at the descending aorta. And if you see fluids beneath it, on the left you see uh, the lung, uh, that's a pleural effusion. And on the right side, uh, you rotate from your liver and lung and you look for fluid. We're going to end this uh, presentation off just with one more last question. What is the efficacy of rescue TE? So, does it work? And you probably see a, uh, see a running or re, uh, reoccurring theme, but it depends. On the most recent evidence, uh, change management in 60% of the cases. In another study, change management in most cases, but it does help. Uh, and even if it doesn't change management, it came up with the working diagnosis 80% of the time. And the more uh, uh, more sad part is that it's highly correlated with the autopsy. So that's the end of my presentation. Again, I, as I promised, a pretty short presentation. If you have any questions, uh, you can email me or uh, pull me aside in the hallway. But I do highly recommend you go to PT Masters and watch the three or four presentations on, uh, on Rescue Accurate. They're extremely well done. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much. This ends the presentation.